Hello, I'm Mark Baer. I'm with uh, Peter Coper, a uh, longtime friend. Just to cut to the chase, I'm going to read from his Wikipedia page, and that'll save us a lot of time here. Peter Coper is an American journalist, professor, screenwriter, and producer. He numbers among the original Dreamlanders, the group of actors and artists who worked with independent filmmaker John Waters on his early films. He has written for the Associated Press, The Baltimore Sun, American Film, Rolling Stone, and People. He worked as a staff writer and producer for Americans Most Wanted and has written television for the Discovery Channel, The Learning Channel, Paramount Television, and Lorimar Television. Coper wrote and co-produced the cult movie Headless Body and Topless Bar and wrote the screenplay for Island of the Dead. He has taught at University of the District of Columbia and Hofstra University. Currently, Coper is contributing writer for the website Splice Today. And pages more and more and more. Anyway. It's enough. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> Welcome. So, um, Peter uh, grew up here as a kid, strangely enough. He grew up in, in uh, Pacific Grove. His father was a language teacher at the International Language School. And uh, he lives in New York in the East Village. And he's here getting out of the COVID and into the cool. Yes. So I guess that sums it up. It's kind of like we're uh, climate refugees, actually. Yeah, cl climate refugees. Yeah, because it's so hot in New York these days that uh, fog and, uh, and cold wind is perfect. So I've been doing a, a series of pieces called uh, Conversations and Collaborations. And Peter wrote a piece during the first days of the COVID outbreak in New York uh, as kind of his reportage style on the street, kind of capturing the zeitgeist of those first crazy days. And I read that and I said, you got to come out. We got to go in on camera. Let's make something out of this. Missive from sometime in the future. This was found in an alley, in a gutter, Crosby Street, just as the invasion of the molecules was coming. I translated it from the original Esperanto. Here it is. In the year of our Lord, 2020, as I write you by dim light, I hear the creaking wheels of the tumbrils rolling along the wet pavement of a steaming hot March night. Their wailing sirens are the signals to bring out those who expired with fetid mush in their lungs. There was no winter before the molecule first appeared. Some said it was the complete absence of snow or ice that brought the molecules. Some old timers among us tell stories of quiet snowfalls and fondly recall pools of dirt iced mush they once had to wade through. I will make sure to pass these stories on to the young so they will be aware what bitter cold once felt like. We saved a winter coat or two to show them how we had to dress in those days. Food, you ask? The local Whole Foods Emporium was a barely controlled scene of hordes of black kids loading up shopping carts, bumping into emaciated young women grabbing oat-infused water and tripping over Amazon workers frantically trying to restock shelves. The puzzling presence of the thin you-go-girl mob was solved when it became obvious they were aspiring fashion models. For some reason, tomato sauce and pasta shelves were picked clean, presumably for a monotonous 14-day quarantine diet. The black kids were consulting cell phones. They were filling orders to be delivered by squads of Somali men peddling carts to millennial IT microsurf petite bourgeois that populate the hovels in hideous glass towers. Only in New York, panic shopping is outsourced. The nobles apparently not having heeded the teachings of Mask of the Red Death or the Exterminating Angel, 
have commandeered SUVs, helicopters, or small private jets, fleeing to their redoubts in quaint rural villages in an attempt to escape the molecules. There they have ransacked local markets and left empty shelves, bought hundreds of deep freezers to shore their foodstuffs, and emptied the purveyors of liquor. The local saint culottes with barely a stock of asparagus left to bring back to their dirt-smudged broods, have reacted with fury. Many fear the rabble will arm with the dreaded AR-15s and storm Citarella. There are even dark rumors of planned executions of Stephen Schwartzman and Ron Lauder on the Maidstone Club golf course. However, a fair person would argue that not enough attention has been paid to the enemy, angst, and anxiety of those among the ancien regime who are suffering facial cream withdrawal. One woman bravely made a dash from her safe room in East Hampton into the city with her driver and a friend to pick up more clothes and the mail and a big giant jar of Le Mer face cream. In the city, streets are now empty, save for the servant castes such as police, mass transit drivers, sanitation workers, bank tellers, nurses, ambulance drivers, and the ever-present corpse removers. The sidewalks solely feature only the eccentrics and the untouchables. Come the morning, had an appointment on the Far East Side. I girded my loins and set out on the subway, careful not to touch anything. The train was empty by New York standards, maybe three people in each carefully disinfected car, all maintaining a discreet two-meter distance from the next person. It became obvious the best way to avoid the molecules is to take the subway. Occasionally on the street, one can glimpse an individual taking a constitutional, getting exercise by hopping over corpses that litter the sidewalk, or walking their pits. I spied a woman in the Greenwich Village out airing two parrots. As for toilet paper, this strikes at the center of the Anglo-Saxon psyches. Their existential fear is not completely with the molecules, but with feces. Hence the frenzy to secure bits of soft paper used to clean their anuses. Curious this, but I leave it to the shamans, wizards, and marketing advertising elders to cast spells on the ether to solve it. As for our needs, toilet paper is available from young ruffians on street corners who display it surreptitiously beneath their long coats and sell it at exorbitant prices. Since we defecate at a robust pace, we've already run out and now use the ancient Arabic method of using the left hand in order to wipe. Stay calm, wash your hands, and keep a Joey Ramon distance from other people, which in the East Village means six feet. The two of us, we've been talking about uh, theater. So let, let's, let's kind of start with, with the play, with, with what you've just finished, and we'll, we'll move back to everything. Right. The, yeah, Social Aid and Pleasure Club is a, uh, uh, a play uh, in development, as they say. Um, uh, the theater world is uh, very slow. Uh, it's easier, I think, sometimes to put a movie together than it is uh, to actually get a play up uh, and actually get paid for it. Uh, it's based on uh, an African-American uh, custom uh, that arose in uh, New Orleans. Uh, in the 1800s, and it is uh, about the wisdom and joy uh, of the uh, New Orleans uh, jazz funeral. It's actually based on a true story. Uh, there was a rich guy in uh, Scotland 
uh, who had spent some time in New Orleans and always admired the, the music of New Orleans. And uh, in his will, he directed his family to bring over a, a jazz band, jazz funeral band. Uh, they call them social aid and pleasure clubs. And uh, uh, to bring that group over, import them to Scotland, uh, all expenses paid, the entire band, and to stage a authentic New Orleans jazz funeral in a tiny village in Scotland. And so it's a fish out of water situation and also kind of a, uh, uh, and a lot of fun because of the music and because of the culture, culture clash. And, but also kind of a meditation on grief and what happens when someone dies, what, ha what, what are the emotions people go through and how in New Orleans, in the black community, how they've faced it throughout the years of uh, their trials. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is they, the jazz funeral is uh, they have, the beginning of the jazz funeral is a dirge. This is after the, the funeral service. Uh, there's a march to the cemetery. And there the, uh, the brass band, marching brass band, plays dirge music, very slow, uh, mournful music. They get to the cemetery, the body is dropped into the ground, and uh, according to this custom, uh, the soul flies away and is finally free. And the, the march out of the cemetery suddenly is up-tempo, it's danceable, uh, there's a second line strut, they call it, and um, uh, this, the, the first line's the, the family. The second line, it just marches through the neighborhood. And people who didn't know the deceased or may not even know the family are invited to join in. There's drinking, uh, there's dancing, and there's partying. And that marches through the whole neighborhood. And that's the New Orleans Jazz Funeral. Interesting is that they have felt... Uh, because of slavery and and uh, and their you know afterwards uh, their economic situations and social strat social situation is that uh, they feel that their life has been suffering and that in fact death is a release and so you get that phrase I'll fly away and so the soul moves on to another world all the cares and troubles are left behind. And that's kind of the, you know, uh, the, 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 the grounding of that myth or that, that custom. So you, it, it's a musical. Uh, y you had a table reading. Yeah. The world looked pretty beautiful. And then this. Yeah. And, and let's just talk about the, the table reading was fun. So yeah. th this is all fun for you. This is really fun. Oh, yeah. No, it's for a writer. Uh, the magic is when you have actors, be it in a movie or... or uh, or a theater piece, when the actors are saying your words and doing your what you've mandated as action, uh, that is the magic. That's the magic moment. Everything else is hard work afterwards. The magic is just seeing the actors actually using your words and telling your story. That's the magic. And That's the you, magic and, moment. And what you learn as a writer is going, oh, that doesn't work. How much, yeah, you know, yeah, a, a yeah, play yeah. doesn't come off the page and go onto the stage. No. There's it, like, it, 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 it never, it never that, that just isn't the way it, it, it works or is meant to work. It, uh, if for years, there are rewrites, 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 rewrites. Every time you have a reading like that, this is about the third reading that this play has had. Uh, it's called Social Aid and Pleasure Club. Every time there's a reading, there's a rewrite. Sometimes major rewrites, sometimes just touch-ups. Uh, then you get a producer on board. The producer wants a rewrite. Uh, then the producer just recently told me, we need a dramaturg on this. So they hired a dramaturg. Now the dramaturg is going to give me notes, and I'm going to work with the dramaturg. Now what, is the, what does that person do? What's the... A dramaturg, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, for a writer, it's just like some asshole that stepped in. It's telling you what to do. Uh, uh, but you've got to work with these people. And particularly if the producer wants it. And they basically cast, they are people that know play structure and cast a very critical eye on the status of the play now on the page. And uh, they will give you notes 
and uh, you kind of talk together about how to what, what the rough spots are, where it could be better, and so on. And then, like a coach, basically. And then you go back and do another rewrite. Then you give it to the producer. The producer says, ah, you know what? Change this, change that. So you do have another rewrite. Then you've hired the, say you've gotten the money, uh, and you are doing now table reads and rehearsals. Each one's got a rewrite. And then you know, they've built the sets, and they're now it's um, the, the technical run through. Ah, more rewrites. Uh, because now there's a set, and this doesn't work, and that doesn't work. And then finally you get to a lock. And it's really interesting because the higher up you go, say, off-Broadway or Broadway, uh, they actually lock those in, the whole play. They run it and rerun it and rerun it. And they lock it in within a second. And then it's locked. And that's what you, when you pay your ticket, you go see it. It works like a Swiss clock, the whole, the whole thing. It's never, not down to the second. So, and then the rewrites stop. So then suddenly, so you're rolling, you're rolling, you're rolling. And then the COVID rolls over everybody. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, and and yeah, it yeah. stops. And yeah, then yeah. you're on the street. So this, let's, let's talk about the piece that we recorded the other night. Daniel Defoe wrote a book in 1620 called uh, Journal of the Plague Year. Uh, it was really one of the first, quote, new journalism, Truman Capote style, novelistic uh, pieces of journalism. Uh, he wrote it... Um, uh, about a plague that had happened, actually it was 1640, he wrote it about a plague that had happened in the early 1600s in London. It was a pneumonic plague, I think, which is really a horrifying plague, uh, that uh, erupted and uh, swept through London and, and through, uh, uh, through Britain, England. Uh, and he went back and had the materials. He was able to go to libraries and find first-person uh, uh, journals of what it was like to be on the street in those days. and But he was already writing 40, 40 years afterwards. And uh, it was a, really a genius book, really well written. And it's really, you could read it and there's echoes of what's going on now throughout the world with uh, COVID. So I pretended, I kind of took that as my, as, uh, as my hook and pretended that this was a piece of a uh, journal that was found floating around in a in a gutter in Manhattan, and um, it had it was uh, written. Fr uh, we are in the future, and it was written at that time. Uh, and basically, I described what was going on, but in terms of what it would look like in the 1600s, i.e., there serve certain classes of people that are the underclass or the servants. Uh, I also kind of mixed in some of the. Uh, uh, French Revolution as far as the reaction of people against the, the wealthy uh, who were holed up in their castles, i.e. East Hampton. Uh, so I, I did those kind of like, uh, those comparisons, you know. And that was that, that, was that piece that you, you liked.